It's good to see you back this morning. It's always good to be home. You know, the events this past week it totally changed the message I had planned for today. But God said this is what we need to talk about this morning. America is at war. There is a war raging in our country. Uh, there's enemies all around the world that would love to see us destroyed, but many of them are within our own country. Uh, we've seen some things that we thought we would never see. The mailing of the over a dozen bombs to key people by a madman out of Florida. What kind of craziness is that? It's just evil. People can say it's political. No, it's not. It's evil. In his mind, it might have been political, but the power behind that is an evil power. It's satanic, trying to tear down a country, trying to destroy people's faith. And then the man that walks into a synagogue where Jewish people are worshiping just starts slaughtering them. Was that political? No, it's just evil. You see, we are in a war of good versus evil. And I hope that you can say, well, I'm on the good side. Well, understand, if you're on the good side, you have an enemy who wants to attack you. You may never have a bomb in your mailbox. I pray that you don't. You may never face anybody with a gun pointed at you pulling the trigger. I pray that that doesn't happen. But you are still in the enemy's sights because the truth of the matter is Satan hates Christians. We are already involved in a war. People are looking at the newscast every day. We were watching a marching army coming to our southern border across Mexico, measuring the distance, measuring the time, how many people were in it, who was in the mob, who was in the crowd, and who was sponsoring it, all of these questions until these other things took place. That's where our focus was attention. It said, look like... We're about to get into a war on our southern border because here's thousands of people saying that we are going to come and we're going to overrun your borders. We're going to defy your laws. But when we get there, we expect to have all of our needs met. Can I tell you that's just more evil? <laughs> that, that's not logical thinking on anybody's part. So what's going to happen when they get there? Our troops are... They're at the border. For what purpose? To protect us from that. So what are they going to do? They're going to be armed. Or are, are they going to pull the trigger? Is there going to be a bloody massacre on our southern border within a matter of days? I don't know the answer to that, but I pretty well know this, that when that mob of people get to the border, the ones that are up front are not going to be the young guys that are in their 20s and in their 30s. It's going to be the women and children they put out front to be slaughtered first in front of the news cameras. I pray it doesn't happen, and I know you're praying the same thing. Folks, are you, are, are you doubting that we're in some sort of a war? That there is an enemy who is against us right now? All I want to let you know something. The war that we are in is not new this is a war that has been going on for years and years and century after century. It's a war that was taking place all the way back in the days of the New Testament. The Apostle Paul writes about it to the Christians in the church at Ephesus. If you've looked up on the screen, you see our focal passage here for Ephesians chapter 6. Please, if you've not already opened your Bible and looked at that, let's do it together. And I want us to begin with verse 12. I know it says 10 through 12, but we're going to kind of do it crawfish Cajun style. We're going to start at the 12 and move backwards, okay? We're going to start at 12 and back up to 11. You'll see why in a minute. Because we are involved in the same war that they were fighting back then. Ephesians chapter 12, um, chapter 6, verse 12 says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. In other words, this is a personal battle he's talking about. This is a personal battle, of, not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And all of those things are different terms meaning demonic force. Demonic forces. And when we're talking about demonic forces, listen, folks, if, if you've got any doubts, demons are real. 
we all want to believe in heavenly angels flying around with wings and looking beautiful and doing wonderful things. But a lot of people say, well, I, don't, I believe in them, but would you believe in demons? Oh, no, that's just some fairy tale. We don't believe in demons. Why not? Jesus believed in them. He cast them out of some folks. Oh, yes, they're very, very real. And these are the demonic forces. These are Satan's soldiers. There's no doubt in my mind that demonic forces have been at work in the newscast that we talked about just a moment ago, this last week that we've been focusing on. That was demonic forces at work. We are in that spiritual war and we're fighting against those. Understand that Satan sees you and he sees me and he hates us. He hates everything about us from the very beginning of time where the Bible tells us God created us in his own image. Satan hates that. Amen. Satan hates God because he's not God and he wants to be God, but he can't be God because there's only one God and God is God and Satan is not. And he's been at war with God since from the beginning of time, before time. And so when he sees people who've been created in the image of God, he sees object of his hatred. So he hates everything about us just because we've been created in God's image. And he hates not only that, but he hates the fact that God loves us. Since he hates God, he hates the things that God loves and he thinks, hates the people that God loves. And so I want to tell you, he hates you. He hates you and you and you and he hates every single one of us. Why? Because God loves you and you and you and every single one of us. And Satan hates that. And he hates the fact that God loves us so much that he sacrificed his own son Jesus on a cross to pay for our sins so that we can be forgiven. He hates that because he hates the fact that when we put our faith and trust in Jesus to save us from our sins... All those sins are forgiven. And the moment we are forgiven, the moment we are saved, everything that Satan has done up to that point in our lives to drag us down to hell, he has led us into all kinds of temptation to rebel against God and sin against God. Everything that he's done is completely erased. There's not even a record of it anymore. He hates that, all of his efforts for nothing, because we've been born again. We've been washed in the blood of the Lamb. We're clean and we're pure. Yeah. Satan hates you, Christian. He hates me too. Oh, listen. When we resist his temptations to sin, he hates that. When we live Christ-like examples so that others can see Jesus in us, you know what hate Satan does with that? He hates it. He can't stand it because others will see Jesus in us and say, I want what you have. I want to know more about this Jesus. And hopefully, Christian, if we're living like we should and if we're proclaiming the gospel like we should be, then there's going to be other people that are going to be won to Christ, other people saved from their sins, other people are going to be born again, and Satan hates every bit of it. So, Christian, go ahead. Be prepared to be hated by your enemy. It's a good thing for Satan to hate you because you're living a Christ-like life. It's a good thing to lead others to Christ and watch Satan hate you even more. Satan hates all Christians. And the more Christ-like we are, the more obedient we are to the great commission of sharing Jesus, the more he's going to hate us. And that is a good thing. You say, I don't know because I don't like being hated by anybody. Nobody likes to be hated. Honestly, we don't. We, we like people to love us. Well, you, your enemy's going to hate you anyway. You might as well deal with it. And your enemy is going to cause you pain and trouble and strife. Even if you're a good person, you still have troubles, don't you? Even if you're a good Christian, you still have troubles, don't you? Your enemy is going to bring problems into your life because he is your enemy. And he does everything that he can do to stop us from enjoying the abundant Christian life that Jesus came to give us. That's how he works. That's what he does. So it's all right to blame the devil for when he's guilty. Go ahead. And he does everything he can to stop us from being holy. God has called us to be holy. And he tries to keep that from happening. He does everything he can to kill our Christian testimony. To make us look and act like people who are following him rather than following the Lord Jesus. Folks, we are in a war. And we must fight it. 
We cannot be passive, hoping things will get better. We must fight the fight to win it. And the good news is we can. We can fight and we can win battle after battle after battle. We know we have the ultimate victory through Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. We know that one day we're going to leave this battle behind, this war behind, this flesh behind, this world behind, and we'll be in heaven with our Lord and Savior forever and ever. And all the problems we ever had with Satan will be completely gone. But in the meantime, we can fight the battles and we can be victorious. We started off in verse 12. Come on, KJ, on, back up to verse 11. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. We know we're going to fight. We know we're going to wrestle against the demonic forces. But we've got to have on the armor to be victorious, to stand against the wiles of the devil. In order to defeat your enemy, you must know your enemy. Know him. Know what to expect. Know his strategy. Know his tactics. Know his trickery. That's what the word wiles means. His schemes, his trickery. He, he, he's, he's out to deceive you. He's out to trick you. He, he, to make you think everything is right when it's wrong. Make you think things are wrong that are right. And whisper in your ear. Oh, he's up to it. He said, well, how does he trick people? He tricks people the way he always tricks people. Starting with Eve. You, you remember the story of Adam and Eve and how Satan came to her in the form of a serpent. And he talked to her about how beautiful it was in the Garden of Eden. She said, oh, yeah. Eat of all the trees, all the fruit in the garden, just wonderful. She said, yeah, we can eat of all but one. And if we eat of that tree, uh, God says we're, we're going to die. We can't, we can't eat of that one. And what did the old devil say? Oh, come on now, he. Look at all this beautiful fruit. Look at all the beautiful trees. And that's the most beautiful one in the garden. Eve, it's okay. It's really all right. Oh, no, she says, God wouldn't want us to do that. He said, don't. Or we'll die. Eve, have you ever known anybody that died? Come on now. No. You're not going to die. You, you misunderstood God. God didn't really say that, or if he did, he didn't mean it. Go ahead. Just take one little bite won't hurt, and it's going to be good. You will be changed. Just one little bite's going to make all the difference for you forever. You will become so wise, you'll become just like God. Well, she'd known God for a long time. We don't know how long, but she'd known God for a long time, and she knew that God was the creator of the heavens and the earth. She knew that God was totally wise, that he knew everything there was to know. And wow, to be able to be as wise as God, that's pretty tempting. The greatest there is, and you can be like him by just taking one bite of that fruit. Eve probably thought about it for a while. She said, you know, that doesn't sound bad at all. If I can be just like God, wow, I'm not going to die. I'm going to live forever. He lives forever. I think I will. She took the bite. She swallowed the lie, and she died. Adam did the same thing, did he not? Of course, he blamed Eve for his problem, but he made the ultimate choice. What happened? Satan deceived them. The wiles of the devil, a trickery, a scheme. All he's got to do is get us to doubt God's word. Friend, are you listening to me? To keep from doubting God's word, you've got to know God's word and you've got to believe the one who wrote it. Right. Even when you don't understand it, even if it doesn't make sense, to eat that fruit is going to kill you. If God said it, believe it and live it. Don't listen to the deceiver. Eve did. The human race has been paying the penalty ever since. She paid with her life. Adam did the same and death entered the world at that time. And every person except two that are recorded in the Bible had died. Even God's own son. Have you ever, have you ever had a little voice in the back of your head saying, 
Don't, don't open that Bible and read it right now. You've got other things to do. I mean, your favorite TV program's coming on. Don't, don't open that Bible. You, you haven't been on Facebook in 20 minutes. You better close that Bible. Come on, you've got, you might miss something here. <laughs> hey, have you ever had that little voice in the back of your head saying, don't read God's Word? Don't spend, oh, that t to waste that time. You've got too much important stuff to do. Have you ever had a little voice in, in the back of your head saying, you don't really need to go to church today? Obviously, I don't know if you heard it this morning or not, but you, if you did hear it, you've ignored it because you're here. But there's no doubt in my mind there's some people that are not here this morning that that's why there was a little voice that says, you don't need to go to church today. Because all you know all that preacher is going to do, he's going to preach out of the Bible. And you've got a copy. You really don't need to go down and listen to the preacher preach. As a matter of fact, if, if he's preaching, just tune him out. I'll give you lots of stuff to think about. I mean, we can think about all kinds of wonderful things that will entertain you. I can give you all kinds of worries to where you won't need to listen to what the Word of God is saying through the man of God at the behind the pulpit. No, 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 no. You, you can go. Well, okay, go, but don't listen. Take a nap. <laughs> Did I wake anybody up then? Anybody get an elbow? <laughs> Have you ever heard that little voice saying, yeah, I know it says that in the Bible, but those were old rules for another time, but not for now. You can forget those old laws and those old commandments. Did you ever hear a voice in the back of your head saying, you don't need somebody else dictating to you how to live? You can be your own master. You can be your own God. Oh, wait, isn't that what Satan told Eve? Yes. It's exactly the same strategy that he has been using since the beginning of the human race. He still uses it. Do what you want to do. That's what Satan says. Do what you want to do. Don't be having it dictated to you by somebody else. You do what you want to do and it'll be fun. You'll like it. And he's not really telling you to do what you want to do. You know what he's telling you? Do what I want you to do. I will lead you. I will guide you. And it will be so much fun. You'll want to keep following me. you want to keep doing what I'm leading you to do. Even though it's going to end in destruction for you. That's Satan's wiles, his trickery, his scheme. That's how he works. Ignore God's word. Forget God. Do it my way. Do it your way, but not his way. This Wednesday is a special day, one day of the year. Many Christians are going to hear Satan's voice and they're going to be tempted to ignore God's word. Turn with me now, if you would, to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Listen to what the Word of God has to say and be thinking about this Wednesday as we look at this. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 17. Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. And touch not the unclean thing and I will receive you. Conditions. You hear what God's saying? He said, you want me to receive you? And he's talking to Christians here. He said, what do you mean? He's talking to Christians saying, receive you. God will receive you. I mean, hadn't he already received us when we got saved? Yes. But there's a difference from being saved and being wrapped up in the loving arms of God and being very, very close to him and experiencing his nearness. Have you ever, Christian, since you've been saved, had a time in your life that you felt like God was a long, long ways away? I know I'm saved. I know I'm going to go to heaven when I die, but right now I, don't, I can't seem to reach God with my prayers. He says, here's what you need to do. If you want me to receive you, you want me to draw you close and hold you in my arms, come out from among them and be ye separate and touch not the unclean things. A lot of Christians are going to be tempted to ignore God's word on that verse. 
too many Christians for too long have ignored it. And they've wondered why God seems so far away. Today, in Christian circles and churches and denominations, there's a major movement for Christians to accept the ways of the lost world, to become more like them and blend in and imitate them. There's there's great movement to ignore sin altogether. Just completely ignore it like it's not there and include sinners in what is supposed to be the blood-bought, washed, uh, bought body of Christ without calling on repentance. Just absorb them in and maybe everything's going to turn out okay. Because if you ignore their sin, they're more likely to come and be comfortable with you than if you pointed out what God says, come out from among them and be ye separate. Touch not the unclean thing. Be ye holy. You start preaching like that and folks are going to say, no, no, I don't want to hear that. I I don't feel comfortable with that. I don't think I'll go back. It's a church growth strategy. Or you can use the word while, W-I-L-E. Same word we saw a moment ago. It's a church growth scheme. But you say, but it works. Have you seen some of these great big churches and how they're growing so fast by their ignoring sin? They're doing exactly that. They're not preaching the Word of God. They're making people enjoy their experience there. They entertain them with great entertainment. Oh, wow, they put on a good show. And people go home and they say, how was it? Oh, man, we were rocking today. Really, is that why you went? Yeah. That's all you did. It's a problem, folks. It's a very real problem. Oh, a lot of folks say, I want to be a part of that church, and they'll join it. I mean, they'll come. They'll flock to it. They want to feel good. And so they say, this is very successful, isn't it? I mean, people like it. But the problem is that's not carrying out the Great Commission. That's not doing what God has called us to do. That's not our primary purpose. Our primary purpose is to confront sin, to win souls and make disciples. Now, a disciple is somebody who is going to follow Jesus in their everyday living. And you cannot do that and ignore sin. We're going to make disciples. Folks, we've got to be disciples and then make disciples. That's what God's called us to do. Now, if we just come to church to have fun, have a good time, get entertained, well... That's all you're going to get out of it. And I don't think God gets too pleased with that. He said, come out and be separate. Come out and be separate. I mentioned this Wednesday night. This Wednesday night is Halloween night. It's a, it's a, a pagan holiday dedicated to darkness and death and demonic powers and to Satan himself. When we think about that and we think about Jesus, we say, wait a minute, they they, they don't fit together. On one hand, you've got death and darkness and demons. On the other hand, you have Jesus who is light and life and Lord. They, They just don't mix. It's like oil and water. They can't mix. And yet many Christians want them to mix. They say, well, that's how the world is. That's how it's fun. And, you know, that's how our kids, we do it for the children. What? You're going to lead children where? Christian, wake up. We cannot do this and expect God to bless us. If you think Halloween is harmless, you have been deceived by the master deceiver. It is not harmless. It's the night where all around the world Satan worshipers really worship their God. It's where all kinds of evil, wicked things take place. And it's considered to be the right thing to do. Preacher, you're preaching against Halloween? Absolutely. You know what we're going to do here at East Ridge on Halloween night? We're going to come together at 515 and we're going to have a meal, a celebration supper. We're going to celebrate the right way, chicken, sausage, gumbo. I mean, we're gonna, that's how we're going to celebrate Halloween. And leave your costumes at home. Just wear your regular clothes. No weird makeup. We're going to come. And we're going to do what Christians do on Wednesday night. We're going to pray together. And we're going to study God's Word together. That's how you deal with Halloween. You just flat ignore it, run over it, and let it go away if it goes away. 
Will it go away? No, but you're not going to be participating in it. We have be care, got to be very car, careful that we touch not the unclean thing. Oh, listen. We are targeted and attacked by demonic forces on all sides as we stand for Christ. And yes, you can expect it. But when we give in to the temptations, when we ignore God's word, to be like the rest of the world, even for one night, we are admitting defeat when we don't have to. We, we, we fit into the picture of what 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 5 tells us. Having the form of godliness, we look like Christians, we talk like Christians, but we're denying the power thereof. Denying the power of God to deliver us from the power of darkness, to set us free, to set us aside, to make us unique, make us different, and stand up and be counted and not worry about it. To go into the battle against the enemy and be victorious. Ephesians chapter 6, go back to where we were. We're going to finish. I told you we're going to go through it backwards, and we are. We started at 12, went to verse 11. And now we go to Ephesians 6 and verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord in the power of His might. We're in a war, a spiritual war. It's been raging since the beginning of time, since Adam and Eve. And it's still going on. But we can be victorious. We can have the strength to defeat the enemy. We have the power of God's might. The greater the temptation we have to give in to the enemy strategies, the greater our power to say no. God wants His children to be victorious. He does not want us to be defeated. He never wants that. When you look at Philippians chapter 4 and verse 10, I'm um, verse 13, I mean... It's a very familiar verse to most of us. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Can on Wednesday night too. You can when the bombs are being placed in the mailboxes of people around the country. You can when they're shooting up the synagogues and the schools and when they come into the Christian churches and shoot them up too. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. When you don't know what to do, you can still know. I don't know what to do, but I know I've got the strength to do it if God's telling me to do it. Whatever the Lord's telling me to do, I can do it. Because I don't do it in my strength, I'll do it in His. The power of God belongs to us. The power of His might. We just have to be willing to take a stand against the wiles of the devil and the power of God's might. We have to be willing to say no to temptation, no matter what form it comes in. We have to be willing to be unique, to be separate. You know, every Christian really ought to have that desire. We should. If we don't have that desire, I wonder if we're really Christians at all. Let me close by saying this. Today, you can experience God's power. Today, you can repent and trust Jesus and be saved and be born again. You can become a Christian today. And yes, you can victory, have victory over the enemy. In whatever area of your life you're struggling, and we know you're struggling because you're here, you can have that victory by God's power when you surrender all that you are and all that you have to Him, saying, Lord, you lead, I follow. Whatever the battle might be, I'm willing to stand with you in the power of your might. If you've never been saved today, guess what? That's why God brought you here. You need the Lord Jesus and you can have Him. You can have Him today. All those sins can be washed away. Every record of it gone and erased. The enemy is defeated. You can defeat Him today if you will, but you do it by surrendering to the Lord. Let's pray. Father, how grateful you are, we are for Your Holy Word. Lord, it's encouraging to us. Even though we might be in the midst of a horrible battle right now, we know that You can give the victory. And however way you choose. Father, I pray for the one right now that's near as hell. The one that has yet to say yes to you. 
They haven't said yes to you yet. Oh, they want to go to heaven, but they haven't surrendered to the Lord Jesus as their Savior and their Lord, and they need to today. <coughs> Father, I pray you'll let them know that, that this just might be their last chance. And I pray that in just a moment as we begin to sing that they'll come forward saying, I've, I've heard enough, I'm, I'm ready today. I'm trusting Jesus right now as my Savior and my Lord. I'm not going to put it off. Father, for others that are Christians that we have, thinking we were compromising, we were really admitting defeat when we didn't have to. Help us, Lord, to be strong in the power of your might to take a stand against the enemy and the wiles of the devil and the, all the demonic forces that come against us. Oh, Father, we repent of not being that way in the past. Help us to be that way now and in the future. And Father, if you're leading somebody to join this church today, we pray that they'll come. Thy will be done in Jesus' name. Amen.